So we were talking about the Uniform Commercial Code and we said, well, the UCC is a model state law that states have adopted uh, pretty much uh, similar to from one state to another. So now that we're moving on to bankruptcy law, what is bankruptcy law? State or federal? Absolutely federal. And in fact, when we look at the Constitution, the Constitution sort of contemplates that Congress will have the authority to enact bankruptcy law. So that's where we sort of see this uniform system, a system that applies at the federal level. That's not to say that states do not have some role to play uh, with bankruptcies, as we'll see when we talk, of, uh, talk about exempt property. But really, the way bankruptcies are governed is really under federal law, and it really is the federal court system that oversees bankruptcies. So bankruptcy law um, was enacted centuries ago, but obviously it evolves over time. And we sort of have two dates there that are kind of landmark dates when we talk about bankruptcy law. Uh, bankruptcy law was majorly overhauled or reformed, if you will, back in 1978. All right, Congress went back and reformed the, some of the mechanics, some of the specifics, some of the processes with respect to filing for bankruptcy. And again, everything is not black or white, but the, but the thinking sort of it was, well, it sort of made it easier uh, uh, to file for bankruptcy, to get more protections uh, under bankruptcy law. And it was viewed as for, by many, maybe not everyone, by many as being debtor friendly, giving more rights to debtors than necessarily to creditors. So we know that in the law, you know, we sort of think of it as being a pendulum. Uh, when, when things are perhaps way too far, and again, this is sort of a matter of opinion, not necessarily a matter of fact. On one side, there will be a cry on the other side to say, well, fix that problem or fix that, you know, fix that, plug that hole or something like that. So there was an effort for many years, uh, mostly by creditors, to say it's too easy uh, for debtors to get bankruptcy protection and to be absolved, as we'll see, of some of the obligations that they have, that there need to be better constraints. Uh, and essentially, that's what led to another overhaul of bankruptcy laws. And this is, and you can sort of see it in the title of the uh, statute when we see bankruptcy abuse prevention, okay, and consumer protection. So the name kind of goes both ways. Well, it's designed to um, somehow curb or stop the perceived abuses. Uh, that perhaps were more, you know, more debtor friendly and still protect because again, the purpose of bankruptcies are to kind of give the debtor a fresh start, whether we're talking about chapter seven, chapter 11, chapter 13 or whatever the case might be, but then also to safeguard the interests of creditors, right? I mean, debtors signed agreements, they signed security agreements, they signed over mortgages, they entered into contracts, whatever the case might be. And it isn't fair that the creditors are held holding the bag. So. So the pendulum might have swung a little bit to the other side. And again, there are critics and so on and so forth, but that's what we have. Uh, we, the latest um, restatement or the reform happened 10 years ago, and that was uh, in the uh, uh, Bankruptcy Act of 2005. So when we talked about the Uniform Commercial Code, we talked about various articles, right? We talked about um, uh, different sections that deal with different types of commercial transactions. So sort of look at, uh, the bankruptcy code or the bankruptcy statute in the same way in that it is set up into different chapters. Um, so the ones that we're going to focus on, there are a lot of procedural uh, chapters as well, but really the four major types of bankruptcies um, that we're going to talk about, we're not even going to talk about chapter 12, I'll just mention it because it really relates to such a small portion of the economy. Uh, we're going to talk about chapter 7 which is sort of the, the straight bankruptcy, the liquidation bankruptcy, what most of us think about when we think about bankruptcy, which is to say, I cannot pay my debt, my assets are too small to pay off my debt, so liquidate everything, satisfy the debt, and give me a fresh start going forward, right? That's chapter seven. Important, but there's also chapters 11 and 13, which are referred to as reorganization. You know, there is financial, trouble here, but there may be a way to deal with it via reorganizing of the debt. So chapter 11 is reorganization when we're not necessarily talking about an individual, although individuals can file for chapter 11 if they don't meet chapter 13 
um, uh, conditions. But chapter 13 is sort of the adjustments of debts on an individual level. You know, an individual, for example, has enough regular income coming in or has a potential uh, to earn, and there might be a way to not go straight liquidation, but find a way to reorganize the debt and have um, sort of a win-win for the debtor and the creditor, whereas chapter 11, as we'll talk about in our context, is more sort of this business reorganization. And again, chapter 12 is basically an adjustment of debts, uh, family, farmer, fisherman with regular income. Again, we're not going to focus too much on chapter 12 if it deals with one uh, industry um, uh, in general. Okay, so keep in mind 7, 11, 13, we'll talk about the mechanics of each of these. So, you've already said that bankruptcy law is subject to federal law. That is absolutely true. Uh, there are federal courts that hear and decide bankruptcy cases, and we'll see, just like a lawsuit starts, for example, with the plaintiff filing a complaint, a bankruptcy proceeding, which is overseen by a court system, starts by someone filing a petition for bankruptcy, right? So U.S. bankruptcy courts are part of the federal court system. There's one for each federal district, meaning there are bankruptcy courts in each of the states. It varies parts of the states. And you know, again, we don't have to look far when we're talking about Newark uh, because it is a hub for a lot of uh, courts, including a federal bankruptcy court. Just sort of, as I say, some jeopardy information, some interesting facts and tidbits. Uh, bankruptcy judges are appointed at the federal level for 14-year terms. No, not something to memorize here, but just something to be aware of uh, in that these are not lifetime appointments, but they're pretty long appointments uh, for, uh, for the judiciary. And what's really significant here is that uh, we have in bankruptcy law this concept of trustee bankruptcy trustees, sort of the wards of the court, essentially lawyers that sort of work with debtors and creditors and kind of shepherd, uh, um, see through the bankruptcy cases, right? We're not talking about litigation here, right? When we talk about uh, bankruptcy courts, they're not hearing testimony, they're not looking at it. They're basically, all they're really doing is looking at debtors and creditors, looking at the type of chapter of bankruptcy it is, and essentially going through the process um, to take a, a bankruptcy proceeding to a conclusion, and really a lot of this is done uh, with the judges overseeing and the trustees doing the day in, day out proceeding on an objective basis. And again, there's so much to bankruptcy procedure, and our job here in one little chapter to get an overview is not to be subject matter experts in the entire procedure, but to understand it from an overview perspective. How does a bankruptcy start? What happens? Some of the key terms and so on. So as I've already sort of hinted, um, Bankruptcy uh, Reform Act of 2005 did a number of things that one could argue uh, were designed to take some of the uh, perceived abuses that debtors had and kind of correct them. And one of the things was a requirement that there be pre and post petition counseling. And here when I use the word counseling, I'm talking about financial counseling, right? So, I mean, we wind up, we, whether we're individuals or businesses, often wind up in trouble over uh, not being able to pay our debts uh, when they come due because of some sort of financial decisions that perhaps could have been made in a better fashion. So before a filing for bankruptcy could be made, there is a requirement that the debtor receive pre-petition counseling within 180 days prior to filing a petition. That's six months, essentially, before a petition for bankruptcy, meaning a filing for bankruptcy can be made, six months before there is a requirement that you sort of raise the right the white flag and, and see if there is a way out of bankruptcy. And of course, when you're talking about financial counseling, there, you know, we're talking about, well, you know, what kind of credit is out there? Uh, is it secured? Is it unsecured? Budget analysis, if, for example, if you're talking about individual bankruptcy filing, is this um, individual a better candidate for Chapter 7 versus Chapter 13. Could Chapter 13 work, which would be better for creditors in the long run, perhaps even better for the debtor, or is Chapter 7 really necessary? Uh, who is it provided by? It's supposed to be provided by nonprofit credit counseling uh, agencies that provide these services, usually at a minimal or no charge. So after this sort of financial counseling, if 
bankruptcy is the only way to go here, then uh, bankruptcy begins with filing a petition. Well, who files the petition? And most of us would think, well, if there is a debtor in trouble, it's a debtor who files the petition and starts the bankruptcy proceeding. And that's usually the case, uh, but not always, because the bankruptcy law contemplates both a voluntary petition and an involuntary petition. An involuntary petition, as you'll see, is not a filing by the debtor, but it's actually a filing by the creditor, right? So most cases start voluntary petition, meaning the debtor wants to get the protection of bankruptcy law. Um, and again, we're talking about any type of the bankruptcy chapters that we're talking about, whether it's chapter seven, 11, 12, or 13, the voluntary petition is available to a, de to a debtor in any type of a, a bankruptcy proceeding. Whereas a creditor might decide that, usually secured creditors, right, because secured creditors are more likely uh, to um, be able to get paid because there's collateral attached to the kind of debt uh, that they've uh, that they've extended, but even certain unsecured creditors might think that the better way to get paid a debtor is in, in fin enough financial difficulty, uh, you know, that that they can force a uh, bankruptcy proceeding, and this can only happen in Chapter Seven and Chapter Eleven cases. It's not for Chapter Twelve or Thirteen, so it's not typical, but it is possible that a creditor or a group of creditors could actually force an involuntary petition of bankruptcy on the part of the debtor. One of the other things, and we'll sort of throw in a few tidbits from the 2005 uh, Reform Act just to kind of highlight um, some of the constraints on filing for bankruptcy. Now there is a requirement that for every bankruptcy petition that is filed, that an attorney independently certify the information. And again, it's just an extra check. It's just putting someone else on the hook. It's trying to get an objective uh, sort of a, 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 a feel for a situation and making sure that each of these bankruptcies that are filed are not done with um, um, fraudulent intent or with an intent to sort of game the system, if you will. So there is uh, this affirmative requirement that every bankruptcy be attorney certified. So procedurally, once a petition for bankruptcy is filed in a federal bankruptcy court, what happens uh, then is that the debtor is essentially looking for what's referred to as an order for relief, meaning um, that the court is basically going to accept the case and move it along uh, um, in, in, in the manner in which you know, each of the chapter calls for. Obviously, as we'll see, when we talk about a chapter 11 reorganization, and if we're talking about a business of any size, we're talking about a bankruptcy that could be under the supervision of the bankruptcy court for months, if not years. Um, but if we're talking about individual liquidation, let's say under Chapter 7, then it could be a more uh, quicker process. But everything procedurally starts with a petition, starts with an order for relief, meaning that the court will grant uh, uh, acceptance of this type of a bankruptcy case, and then we'll move on. We'll move on uh, in the sense that now the trustee, as we'll see, will sort of take uh, inventory of the debtor's assets, the debtor's liabilities, uh, the transactions that have taken place and so on, and in a very orderly way, resolve these debts in the process, in the priority that the bankruptcy law has set out, and we'll see what all of that means. So what is required from each of the creditors of the debtor in a bankruptcy case is what they're owed, right? So a proof of claim is how we refer to these as in, in bankruptcy law, and this is a document that is required by every creditor, secured or unsecured, that basically lays out their claim against uh, the debtor. Uh, you know, it's a filing. It's a filing again. If we're talking about uh, secured transactions, uh, we're talking about you know the various uh, documentation that may exist between the debtor and the creditor, and if we're talking about even unsecured claims, we're talking about the documentation that sort of evidences the debt that the debtor has uh, again, uh, with the creditor. Uh, and again, proof of interest, a document uh, required to be filed by an equity security holder that states the amount of his, um, uh, of his uh, uh, interest against the debtor. And again, we're talking about 
uh, Chapter 11 cases or a business reorganization that we might very well have uh, this situation. So essentially, this is basically the court taking inventory, the trustees taking, taking inventory of all the credit that the debtor is uh, responsible for paying back. And on the next slide, uh, when we talk about automatic stay, I mean, that really is such an important and powerful concept when we talk about bankruptcy law. Uh, because oftentimes, you know, again, in a typical case, no one wants to be in that scenario, right? I mean, bankruptcy is sort of this, this, this notion of, uh, of a fresh start, which is, you know, sort of on the positive side, but there's also a lot of negative connotation, right? I mean, going forward, this debtor will somehow be stigmatized, at least on a financial uh, basis, right? So getting to the stage obviously means that the debtor genuinely is in some sort of trouble, um, is being hounded perhaps by creditors, is looking for uh, a stop to all of this so they, you know, they can essentially gain stock of what they have. So what the bankruptcy filing does is provides that debtor with the protection of an automatic stay, which means everything stops. The proceedings, the collection proceedings stop. Uh, the hounding stops. It has to legally, right? It's a suspension of certain legal actions by creditors against a debtor or the debtor's property that include legal actions to collect debts, right? Those stop because the bankruptcy court is now overseeing the whole process. We talked about judgments last class, right? We talked about writs of garnishment, writs of attachment, and so on. To the extent that those remain uncollected, they stop for now. Um, obtaining, perfecting, or enforcing liens against property of the debtor, no more, right? Uh, the debtor is under the protection of the bankruptcy court. Non-judicial collection efforts, other ways in which to collect debt. They can't, you can't now work out, you know, a debtor that files for bankruptcy now cannot go out and say, all right, I'll deal with this creditor and satisfy my debt to that creditor. You can't do that because now the assets have to sort of be used in a prioritized manner to satisfy debts in you know, in, 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 in the way that's essentially specified under the bankruptcy code. So it's really stopping everything. That's what an automatic stay essentially is. And I know we haven't yet talked about the different types of bankruptcies, but what the debtor is looking for is a discharge, right? They are looking for a valid court order that basically absolves a debtor uh, from some of the contractual obligations that they might have had, um, some of the uh, debts that they would otherwise have to pay, right? Not everything, as we'll see, is discharged, even in a straight liquidation. I mean, you can't have everything discharged. There are certain things that, that are going to follow you uh, no matter what. Um, but there are some debts, for example, um, unsecured debts, where there just isn't enough money in a bankruptcy estate to pay it out, that might be discharged, right? So in other words, a debtor is not legally responsible for things, but for the fact that they filed for bankruptcy. So that's really, really quite significant. Right, so so far what's really important is this concept of automatic stay, discharge, petitions, uh, proof of claim, so on and so forth. If anyone can read all of that, I give you a lot of credit. It's small print, it's not something, that it's just, yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, the credit. So the question is, when you talk about discharge, does that mean that the creditors cannot get their entire debt paid? Yeah, it could mean that, you know, because, I mean, just think of a sim simple scenario. What if there are, you know, there's, there are $100,000 of assets and there are $300,000 of debt, right? and someone is filing for a Chapter 7 liquidation. We'll see in a minute that, you know, uh, essentially secured creditors are going to have priority over unsecured creditors, right? So let's say there's $50,000 in secured debt. Well, that gets paid out. Now there is $50,000 of assets left and $250,000 of unsecured creditors. So when you hear the phrase sometimes of, you know, everyone's getting paid, you know, 10 cents on the dollar or something like that, that's essentially what, what, what's happening. You're, you're not getting your entire debt paid off, and the creditors essentially wind up eating the loss. Um, so that, you know, th again, that's sort of the tension of bankruptcy law. Uh, there's not going to be enough money. It's understood, but the question is, you know, in what 
prioritized way, in what sort of an organized way do we deal with that? So yeah, that discharge could very well mean that predators, and often means that predators are, uh, are not paid you know, uh, fully on the, on the credit that they extended. So I said a few minutes ago that there are certain types of debts that cannot be discharged. You know, we think about credit card debt as perhaps the biggest example, sometimes big hospital bills that get people into trouble and so on, and a portion of those might be discharged in bankruptcy. But other types of debt that a debtor might have could essentially follow them even after a discharge in bankruptcy. And these are things like, not surprisingly, I often sort of uh, laugh when I see uh, taxes owed to Uncle Sam uh, are usually at the top of every, <laughs> every, every list. Uh, but that might not be something, and again, these are not hard and fast rules, but these are the types of debts that generally cannot be discharged uh, in bankruptcy. Uh, what else? I'm just sort of trying to pick out a few things that um, claims based on fraud, uh, you know, if the debtor, um, uh, you know, was, was involved in a, a lawsuit, and what they are found guilty of is not negligence, but it's intentional fraud or larceny or some sort of a criminal act. Well, those types of debts sometimes can't be on principle uh, discharged. Uh, other types of things, one that I don't necessarily see up here, but I think it's a big one, and I think it's something that's interesting to you guys, perhaps in some ways. Thank you, student loans. Oh, yeah, size. Generally speaking, student loans are not dischargeable. That's not a 100% black or white rule. I mean, one could make the argument of you know, undue burden and try to prove that it would just be unconscionable uh, for the court in a particular situation to not give a discharge from that. But generally speaking, that is not something uh, that was alimony, you know, domestic uh, obligations and so on are another example. So there are certain things, again, from a public policy perspective, uh, that the bankruptcy court is not designed to discharge debts over. So, you know, you get a fresh start, but not necessarily a fresh start from every type of obligation that a debtor might have. Okay, bankruptcy estate. I think that's sort of a, you know, it's a big word, <laughs> estate. When we think of an estate, we think of wealth, and we think about you know, ab abundance and so on. When we talk about a bankruptcy estate, we're not, ex you know, it's just the term of art that's used under the bankruptcy statute. All we're really talking about is the debtor's property, right? What does the debtor have in terms of assets, right? What earnings even, you know, income that's coming in. What are the debtors, you know, what is on one side of the column that can be used to pay out uh, all, all the debts that the debtor has. So it's basically the bankruptcy court, the banks of bankruptcy trustee, taking stock of the debtor's uh, assets and earnings. Includes interest of debtor and the debtor's spouse in community property as well. So if you're talking about an individual or a family-owned business or things like that, where it's sort of scooping in everything that is a legal interest that the debtor would have in, uh, uh, in property. And from that, I mean, when you think about what a person owns, for example, right? What do we think about? What's one of the big things that someone may own? A house. What else? A car, right? These are the, the big items. What else? Stocks, bonds, jewelry, things like that. And you know, of all of those things, if somebody was going to be uh, filing for uh, bankruptcy, what do they need to have even after bankruptcy? A place to live, yeah. You know, maybe a place, a way to get around, right? So, you know, I, you know, the notion here is that the idea of bankruptcy laws are not to punish necessarily, but to rehabilitate, right? So there is this concept of, well, we're taking stock of the debtor's property, but not every single thing of value is going to be liquidated, for example, in Chapter 7, to satisfy uh, the debt. There is certain property that is going to be exempt, not included in the bankruptcy estate, right? So this is property that may be kept, retained by the debtor, both under federal or state law, that doesn't become a part of the bankruptcy uh, estate. And you might say, well, didn't I just say a little while ago that bankruptcy law is federal law? It is, procedurally, but there are some, uh, you know, state uh, laws that relate to bankruptcy, and one of them is this notion of exempt property. 
And this was a big one when it came to why the bankruptcy, not why, but one of the reasons why uh, those in favor of reforming bankruptcy's law argued that there should be some more protection given to creditors. And it really related to the amount of property that could be exempted from the bankruptcy estate. All right, another big slide, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So the federal law gives certain exemptions, right? States can go even further. So for example, if you read the first one, right? Federal law says that you get not, you don't get to keep your house per se, but you get to keep up to some number that is adjusted for inflation, which is why it's sort of a funny number, $21,625 of equity in the house. You know, we happen to live in a part of the country uh, where housing prices are pretty darn high. You know, so if an individual, for example, files for bankruptcy and gets to keep you know, an equity of $21,000, that's not a heck of a lot, right? You can't say, all right, I'm gonna go buy another house for $21,000 even after bankruptcy. That's, that's a relatively small number. But you know, federal law is, is not as generous, if you will, right? I mean, they would sell the house, give the equity of $21,000 and say, all right, go rent. And ba you know, this is how much we're sort of giving you towards a housing uh, sort of an allowance, right? We talked about cars, uh, interest up to $3,400, right? If you have a used car and it's only $2,500, bankruptcy court will not make you sell it. But if you're driving in an Acura blah, 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 and it's $50,000, you bet that that's going to be sold and you know a mere $3,500 is going to be given to you in terms of a, a, a car. So that's, you know, and you go on and on and on. Those are types of exemptions under federal law. So what did the states do? They upped a lot of these exemptions, allowing um, the debtor to have a larger percentage of exempt property. And that's fine, right? I mean, state law and federal law, as we've seen in a lot of different areas of the law, can coexist, and they do. Um, so states can give debtors the option of choosing between federal and state exemptions, and wouldn't you go for a higher exemption? And most debtors would. Um, um, uh, follow the state law in this case. And the big one here is the homestead exemption, right? That's, again, when I said, what is the biggest property that an individual debtor would have? Well, obviously, it's your house. So equity in a debtor's home that the debtor is permitted to retain. And guess what? States were all over the map on this. You know, some obviously most allowed for a higher exemption than the 21,000, but others allowed for an outright full exemption. So what was starting to happen under bankruptcy law was people were buying property in states such as, can anyone give me examples from the reading of states that were sort of known as debtor's haven? Texas is one of them, another big one. Florida is a huge one. So it was an outright exemption. So one could have, for example, a million dollar property bought in Florida five years ago that wouldn't be touched if that was the primary residence, wouldn't be touched under uh, 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 the bankruptcy. And that really was abusive according to, uh, and, and even on an objective basis, according to a lot of the critics. So uh, what happened under the 2005 Act is, um, excuse me, is a requirement that property purchased within, and I forget the exact time period, a year, two years before, um, no matter what state it's in, is not going to get the outright homestead exemption. Uh, so it's a, just another way in which some of these holes were plugged and some of the notions of that, you know, bankruptcy not being as easy, not being sort of this abusive thing that perhaps some people engage in simply to game the system. Um, you know, those are the kinds of practices that it was designed to correct. But that's not to say that states don't continue to have a much more liberal homestead exemption, they do. It's what, you know, it's this notion that some states can just sort of attract a lot of investment simply by giving a full homestead exemption. Um, those are the kinds of practices that have been really done away with for the most part. Yes. So the question is, are these exemptions applicable no matter what the chapter? And the answer is not quite. I mean, this is really more chapter seven because if you'll see chapter 11 really isn't about liquidating property. What it is is this notion of 
continuing to operate. So yeah, if you're so the short answer is no, because if you're talking about chapter 11, you're not liquidating. All right, so with that as a segue, let's talk a little bit. And again, we're only talking a little bit. We're talking really just scratching the surface here. Uh, of the different types of bank, uh, different types of bankruptcies. So as I said, they're really organized into different chapters. Let's start first with uh, chapter seven, which is referred to as a liquidation bankruptcy or a straight bankruptcy. Um, so it's a form of bankruptcy in which, quite simply, the debtor's non-exempt property, and we know what that means now, right? I mean, you've got the whole bankruptcy estate, but you take from it some exempt property. So the non-exempt property is sold for cash. Uh, and the cash is then distributed to creditors, and any unpaid debts are discharged. Sounds simple enough, but as we see that there is a whole process by which that will happen. As I said, this is also termed as state bankruptcies. Uh, and what's really significant here is that the debtor's future income cannot be reached, right? So a, a, a chapter seven bankruptcy, if someone is a proper candidate for that type of bankruptcy, allows the debtor to essentially really get that fresh start. Meaning, yes, there will be the stigma, creditors won't be as, as willing to lend someone credit there, and so on, but to the extent that this debtor now becomes wildly successful in their next endeavor, that doesn't mean that those creditors that did not get paid in the past can go after him. Uh, it just cannot happen. That's what this notion of discharge is all about. shouldn't surprise us to know that there are some dishonest individuals out there, dishonest business uh, uh, owners out there. So um, there is a, a mechanisms built into the bankruptcy law and a lot of them that are designed to prevent abusive filings. This, this notion of you know stashing away property over a period of time so that it can't be reached uh, under bankruptcy law. Uh, fraudulently giving away property to family members and then filing for bankruptcy and saying, well, I, you know, these are my assets, right? So those types of things are why, you know, I, it takes a while to gather property, to make sure that that sort of, uh, those sort of transactions did not take place because essentially what are you doing? You're harming the creditors uh, unlawfully. I mean, that's a criminal act, but it also comes at a financial cost to the parties uh, that are involved. I'm not expecting anyone to know the details of the median income tax and so, uh, and so on, but I just want to explain what this concept is. Um, one of the things that the 2005 Act did was it didn't just allow debtors to say, gee, should I go into Chapter 13 or should I go into Chapter 7? Um, it really requires, through this counseling process, to figure out where the debtor actually belongs. Where is the debtor? How much trouble are they in? What is their income? What is the potential uh, for their income? What are their debts and so on? Where does it fall based on state cost of living guidelines and so on and so forth? And is someone uh, perhaps a candidate for chapter 13 versus chapter seven, right? Because in chapter seven, the, the creditors will be held holding the bag for debts that are not repaid, whereas in Chapter 13, it is possible over time that they will get more on their debt back than they would otherwise. So it basically requires a process of figuring out, to the best that someone can, looking into the future, where or what chapter of bankruptcy is better uh, for this, uh, for this in, you know, individual or business or whatever the case might be, based on income, based on income potential, based on where the assets are, and so on and so forth. And again, if someone is indeed a candidate for Chapter 7, that's liquidation. Um, and um, you know, once again, you sort of look to see um, which kind of creditors are going to get paid first and which kind of creditors are going to come after. Um, there are a couple of sort of terms used there, over-secured secured creditor and under-secured secured creditor. What do you think that ter those terms mean now that we've talked about security interest last class and does 
do people have a sense of what it means to be an oversecured secured creditor versus an undersecured secured credit? What, what does a secured creditor have that makes collateral? So what do you think is the difference between over versus under secured from a creditor standpoint? Exactly, and I think that's where a lot, yeah, I mean, is the collateral more valuable than the amount of debt that you have? Because if it's more valuable, you're getting paid fully if you're an oversecured creditor. But, for example, if you have $100,000 remaining owed to you, but the value of the collateral, for example, let's say the collateral is inventory, has reduced down to 50000 well, if you're the only secured creditor, you can be assured that you'll get the fifty. But what about the other 50? You know, for that, you are a undersecured secured creditor, meaning you're just going to be an unsecured creditor, and you're going to get in line with other creditors that are also unsecured, and there may not be much priority there. And if you're all on the same footing, you're all going to get paid out based on a percentage of what remains, right? So that's what we mean by oversecured versus undersecured. They become general unsecured creditors for that portion, for, with, for the portion. Yeah, not for the whole thing. Yeah. Everyone clear on that? And again, Chapter 7 discharge is basically sort of the last step. It's the ending the duty, the legal duty that an individual debtor would have to pay unsecured debts that remain unpaid upon the completion of a Chapter 7 proceeding, which essentially means that the debtor is not responsible for paying pre-petition debt out of post-petition income. What does that mean? Pre-petition meaning the debts that were owing when the bankruptcy filing was made are discharged and do not need to be paid legally from any income that the debtor has earned since filing for bankruptcy. That is the powerful protection of discharge in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy case. Okay. Really, really broad summary of these concepts. I never realized just how many um, t uh, slides had very, very small text. And by the way, this is all in our reading. And again, this is just to give a flavor uh, for the different types of um, unsecured creditors, for example, here. Who are unsecured creditors? Unsecured creditors could be former spouse, right? Alimony, child support, what else? Um, number two is sort of interesting. Um, you actually have to pay lawyer's fees, court fees, and so on. That is an unsecured debt uh, that comes out of the bankruptcy estate. Uh, what else? Secured claims of gap creditors. These are your undersecured secured creditors. Uh, unsecured claims for wages, salary, commissions. So, for example, if it's a business that files for Chapter 7, the money that they owe their employees, right? So, so, you know, you get a flavor for all sorts of the money that should have gone into employee benefit plans, meaning, you know, the money that your employer was supposed to be putting into the 401k match or things like that, and on and on and on. I mean, you know, when you think about debts or obligations, um, the list goes on and on, but these are all unsecured obligations and what it means is that you have to look to see the assets of the debtor and all of these various obligations of the debtor and you know that there's not going to be a dollar for dollar match here and that's essentially why the debtor is in bankruptcy in the first place all right what are the kinds of things that a debtor could do that could bounce them out of Chapter 7, meaning they're not entitled to the fresh start, uh, the privilege of going through a Chapter 7 liquidation. And I've sort of hinted at this, right? Discharge is something that you get that is a powerful relief um, to a financially strapped debtor, but things like lying about your financial position when obtaining credit, right? Again, fraudulent. Uh, behavior, debtor transferring, concealing, meaning hiding, removing, destroying, estate, meaning property, with intent to defraud creditors, right? Possibly a criminal act, but most definitely something that does not and will not give that kind of a debtor protection under Chapter 7. And that sort of behavior, debtor falsifying, destroying, or concealing records, don't think it doesn't happen. Sadly, it does. 
debtor failing to appear at a meeting of creditors. And remember, I said there's a lot of process here, right? It's not a typical court case, but what it involves, if you want the protection as a debtor of the bank's, what a bankruptcy discharge could give you, you have to play by the rules, which means that the trustee is going to require you to come into court, to come into meetings, to sit there with the creditors, to figure this whole thing out, you know, not playing. Uh, with the procedure could bounce you out of bankruptcy court. Debtor failing to complete a course on personal financial management. So again, these are the kinds of things that the 2005 Act requires, right? Pre-counseling, post-counseling, things like that to, you know, if you're talking about, for example, a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, a lot of it is just habilitating, meaning changing the debtor's financial practices and not playing by the rules of the game will not give you the protection that bankruptcy could do otherwise. So let's now move on from Chapter 7 to Chapter 13. Right? And Chapter 13 is not liquidation. It is not a straight bankruptcy. It's actually an adjustment, right? an adjustment of debts of an individual. It's only available to individuals. We'll see that if you want an adjustment of reorganization and you're a business, for example, you go under Chapter 11. Right, so this is only for individuals, and these are for individuals with, quote unquote, regular income, whatever that means. Right, I mean, you can guess what that means. It means someone with the capability to earn, have earnings in the future that they can satisfy some of these debts that are not payable today, but if they were somehow, if the credit terms were adjusted and so on, if they were maybe stretched out, that it would be possible to pay these debts. So this type of bankruptcy is also referred to as a rehabilitation form of bankruptcy, right? Rehab, you fix something uh, that is ultimately broken from a financial perspective, right? Again, we're talking about a court filing, right? A court filing petition under uh, Chapter 13, and then the court supervising a plan of payment of unpaid debts by installments, right? And you might say, well, gee, if someone has entered into an agreement with a creditor and that agreement essentially says that you will pay 10% interest and it will be paid out in 10 months, then that's an agreement, right? Violating that agreement is a breach of contract. So you couldn't do that on the outside, but under the uh, supervision of the bankruptcy court, that's essentially what's gonna happen in a legal way. And a creditor is willing to go along with it because what's the alternative? The alternative is getting paid less, perhaps under Chapter uh, 7. So the notion that you could actually have um, you know, debt paid back over a longer period of time, perhaps with lower interest, or perhaps only get a portion of it paid, but being paid off you know, uh, is still better than not getting paid at all. So what are the advantage of Chapter 13 versus Chapter 7? Well, from a debtor's perspective, you avoid the financial stigma of having filed for a Chapter 7. You get to keep more of your property, right? We're not talking about liquidating. And it is a, uh, supposed to be a much um, less expensive um, mechanism than Chapter 7 would be. And of course, we know from a creditor's perspective, either, uh, you know, either type of bankruptcy is not desirable. But if you're dealing with a debtor that um, could go into Chapter 7, you rather that they go into Chapter 13 because you're likely to get more of your debt repaid than you would under Chapter 7. So it really is a win-win, but it's not right for every situation. But it is something that the 2005 Act forces more individuals to look at than was required in the past. How do you go into Chapter 13 bankruptcy? Well, you have to file a voluntary filing. Your creditors cannot file an involuntary filing. It's something only the debtor uh, initiates. And again, it has to be a debtor with regular income. And what's also significant here is the type of debt. Chapter 13 is only intended for consumer debt, not business debt, and that's important. And by consumer debt, we're not just talking credit card. We're also talking about, and this is something that gets a lot of people into trouble, medical expenses. 
unpaid medical expenses. You know, you think about what could be a big ticket item um, that would be something out of um, the ability of most individuals to pay. It's being uninsured and having an unforeseen uh, event happen and a hospital bill of $50,000, right? That just would, would leave, ev leave anyone um, in with, with modest means you know, without any ability to pay that back. So again, that is an example of consumer debt. That's what chapter 13 is intended for. And please don't memorize these numbers, but it gives you an idea of how much debt one could have. And still, consumer debt, and the numbers are glaring, up to $360,000 in unsecured debt and up to a million dollars in secured debt. Right, so we're not talking about small monies here. I mean, when you just think about a mortgage that somebody has, I mean, th those numbers could add up. So that's not to say that consumer debt is a couple of thousand dollars. It could, it could be significantly more. I mean, these numbers have been raised quite a bit under Chapter 13 to allow more people to come into Chapter 13 and qualifying for Chapter 13 rather than having no other choice but to go into Chapter 7. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea that a lot of people could fall into Chapter 13. Yeah. Or possibly 11, possibly. You know, especially if you have business, a combination of business and consumer debt. You know, again, if reorganization is something that is workable versus straight liquidation. And again, we're still talking about the same thing uh, when we talk about procedurally from a chapter th uh, 13 perspective, the bankruptcy court is basically looking at all of the non-exempt property, right? Not with a view towards liquidating it, but with a view towards, well, how much is it and how much of it can generate enough to pay off debtors over a period of time that could you know, be a win-win for debtors and creditors. So you're looking at non-exempt property and you're looking at earnings and future income and you're trying to match the two to try to come up with a plan of reorganization. So chapter 13 contemplates that the trustee in working with the debtor and creditors will come up with a plan of reorganization or a plan of payment. Right, that's all bankruptcy law is concerned about, dealing with debt, right? So um, it's a process. And there are all sorts of arbitrary time limits and so on under bankruptcy code. You gotta file a plan of payment within 90 days from when the court accepts a case. Can this be extended? Of course it can. But there are sort of time limits procedurally when you talk about a court proceeding. And technically speaking, the plan has to be accepted by secured and unsecured creditors or approved by the court. Now, if a debtor has 10, 12 cre creditors and one or two are not happy because they're not getting uh, enough, you know, it doesn't have to be everyone approves. It doesn't have to be a unanimous thing, but it has to be something that a significant percentage of creditors are in agreement with. Um, and it's understood that during the plan period, unsecured creditors might not receive full payment of the debt owed to them. So I don't want people to think that somehow under chapter 13, that they're not going to have to eat some of their debt. They might still, but the idea is that presumably a greater portion is expected to be paid out under chapter 13 than it would under chapter seven. And a plan of payment, once it's approved and blessed by the court, is then confirmed, um, gotten the stamp of approval by the bankruptcy judge. And you know, these are the kinds of things, I mean, remember the court is not, you know, the judge is not overseeing at each and every one of these cases. The details are being worked out over a period of time with the trustee and the debtor and the creditor working together. And the conditions for a plan essentially are that they be proposed in good faith. Right, sitting here today, the debtor is agreeing that over the next five years, um, they're gonna pay off this creditor. Over the next three years, they're gonna pay off that creditor. I mean, each of these terms have been negotiated and accepted um, by the debtor and the creditor. The question is, are they proposed in good faith? Right, and what does good faith mean again? And we use that term quite a bit in the law. 
to the best of, you know, I mean, it's, you know, not with sort of bad intentions to begin with, you know. The plan passes the feasibility test. What does the word feasible mean? Yell it out. Possible, doable. I mean, does it mean a reality check? The smell test, right? I mean, is it unheard of that someone who has a potential to make $25,000 a year for the next five years is going to pay off debts that are far more than that? It just wouldn't be possible. So is it even within the realm of possibility? The plan is in the best interests of the creditors. Well, best interest given the circumstances that we're in, because the best, the total best interest of the creditor would mean that everyone gets paid fully. You know, best interest when you look at you know uh, the scheme of the financial trouble that this debtor is in are are, are the debtors, for example, I'm sorry, the creditors, for example, being treated fairly when you look at you know all of them together. The debtor has paid all domestic support obligations owed, right? I mean, again, when we're talking about alimony, child support, that takes more precedence than, you know, debt owed to other parties. <laughs> and I love the last one. The debtor has filed all applicable federal, state, and local tax returns. Uncle Sam always wants to get paid, right? <laughs> so, you know, you got to take those considerations into account as well. And again, what Chapter 13 does, just like Chapter 7, is give the debtor discharge, right? A discharge in a Chapter 13 case is given at the end, at the end after the debtor's plan of payment is completed. And remember, a Chapter 7 case liquidates and ends matters and gives the debtor a fresh start from that point. A Chapter 13 discharge might take a longer period of time. Right, because you're reorganizing, readjusting uh, things, and it might be that the last creditor isn't paid off under your plan of payment for five years from the date that you filed your petition. Right, so that discharge doesn't come until that plan of payment has been uh, satisfied. You know, I give numerous examples of how the 2005 Act was intended to be, quote unquote, more creditor friendly. And one of the ways it did that was it basically said that you cannot be discharged under Chapter 13 if the debtor has received discharge under what? If you'd filed for a Chapter 13 two years before, or you'd filed for Chapter 7 or 11 within four years. So this notion of habitually just going and filing for bankruptcy, um, not something that you're going to be allowed to do with the reform under the 2005 Act. So there has to be a time period, you know, with after only after the lapse of that time period can you go back to court and claim that you need bankruptcy protection again. And again, I'm not looking for people to memorize the time periods, but I'm looking for you to understand and remember that there are these time periods, you know, that exist uh, within which you can file for different chapters. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, what if you know you're under this plan of payment during this Chapter 13 reorganization? And voila, uh, you know, your luck changes and your fate changes and you come into a lot of money. You know, the case has not been, no discharge has happened. It's revisited and your plan of payment can be adjusted and should be adjusted accordingly. But the opposite can happen as well, you know, and that's more typical, quite frankly, which is um, things are moving along, but you actually suffer more severe financial uh, consequences. You lose your job. You fall ill, and it's just not feasible anymore. Sadly, a lot of Chapter 13s turn into Chapter 7s after all. Um, so, yes to your answer, but also the flip side is actually more um, more prevalent for the most part. Okay. So we said we, uh, you know, we're going to do 7 and 13, 12. We're just mentioning the family fisherman and family farmer, but it really is chapter 11, which is the last chapter of bankruptcy that we're going to talk about, and this is reorganization, okay? This, these are not individual reorganizations uh, for the most part uh, with limited debts. This is, you know, beyond that. 
So what is Chapter 11? Chapter 11 is a bankruptcy method that allows reorganization of the debtor's financial affairs under the supervision of the bankruptcy court. Yeah, it's a reorganization. Who is it for? It is for individuals, for individuals, for example, with financial, I'm sorry, with business debts, right? Because they cannot take advantage of Chapter 13, which is only for consumer debts. But also it is for businesses. It's for partnerships, corporations, S-corps, you know, um, LLCs, whatever the case might be, any other type of a business entity. And what's, you know, and we read about Chapter 11 proceedings all the time, right? When times are tough, we read about them more. When times are a little bit better, we read about them a little bit less, right? So the idea here is that we want, just like we want to give the individual a fresh start, we want to give a business a fresh start. And the way that could happen is we allow the business under the supervision of a bankruptcy court and perhaps a trustee to work through and create a new capital structure that is more sustainable than the model that landed them in trouble, right? And under the system, again, sadly, um, the creditors often get the short end of the stick because what will happen is a debtor may be relieved of some of their debts, right? Uh, even though we're talking about a reorganization, but that reorganization might trim off some of the um, obligations that the debtor might have. Um, and these are usually related to burdensome executory contracts. What are executory contracts? Remember back to business law one when we talked about contracts law, we talked about contracts that are executed and executory. What's the difference? Not yet satisfied. Open contracts. And you might say, well, you could, you know, to, to change the terms of a contract when the other party doesn't want to would otherwise lead to a breach of contract and you could be sued for damages, right? But when you're in a Chapter 11 proceeding, you could do that legally to the extent that that would further the interest of your bankruptcy uh, proceeding. Um, and unexpired leases, again, if you're talking about being under the burden of, 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 a, of a real estate transaction or other types of contracts that are the primary reason why you're going into bankruptcy, well, a court and a trustee could work with you to reorganize that so that it would be beneficial to the creditors as a whole, right? That's the idea of a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And a term of art that's sort of used in Chapter 11 is this concept of debtor in possession, sometimes referred to as a DIP, D-I-P, debtor in possession. And who is this debtor in possession? Well, it's the business, for example, that's left in place to operate the business during the reorganization proceeding. So, you know, sometimes a company is going through Chapter 11 and it's, things are happening behind the scenes. But on the other hand, business continues as normal, right? You know, we think about a lot of the retailers that we love to shop at, all of us, um, have been um, through this bankruptcy proceeding. Airlines, right? Um, the glaring example of a bankruptcy that sort of happened at the national stage was the recent bankruptcy of GM, you know, sort of overseen by the federal government, right? So we're talking about, you know, this notion that, you know, the only way you can kind of keep the business going um, is essentially to allow the debtor to continue while behind the scenes the capital structure is changing, right? So that's this concept of debtor in possession, going about their business, paying the wages of, uh, you know, employees and so on while they're negotiating things in the background. But this debtor is understandably in financial trouble. There are a lot of creditors out there that need to get paid. Uh, and the debtor at present does not have the ability to do that. So a creditor's committee is formed. It's a committee of unsecured creditors that is appointed by the court to represent the class of unsecured claims. And again, if we're talking about a large business and they have, you know, make up a number, 200 creditors, it would be unworkable. Uh, to some extent, to have every creditor come to every meeting. So what the creditors essentially do is nominate, you know, I mean, these are the retail creditors, these are the real estate creditors, or whatever the case might be, and they basically allow someone to represent them at these meetings while these negotiations are happening. Or, for example, and we'll see in a minute, 
that uh, one of the big reasons that, for example, airlines and car companies and so on over the past uh, years have wound up in a lot of financial trouble is their um, agreements with unions, right? They have agreed under union contract to very rich retiree medical benefits, for example, or, or uh, pensions or uh, wages or whatever the case might be. And you know, they've got, the, they've got the Teamsters and they've got the steel workers and they've got the administrative, I mean, the, all these, so again, it would, you know, to negotiate that, and you know, the courts are very, very protective of, of rights of workers at the same time, right? If a worker has been promised a pension and promised benefits and so on, it's not like the courts are looking to trim that, but they're trying to find a way to work out a balance so that it is possible for the company to continue in existence and pay those out, and at the same time for the workers not to lose their shirts, right? So that sort of thing is often happening in the background, and um, you know, not to necessarily to everyone's uh, satisfaction, but in the end coming up with a solution that supposedly would work in the long term. Okay sort of already talked about it, what is an executory contract? It's a contract or lease that has not been fully performed. Uh, the debtor may have a right to reject executory contracts on expired leases in bankruptcy. You know, may is the operative word there, right? I mean, if there is um, a contract that a company had, uh, let's say at an office building, where when times were good, they had, you know, 4,000 employees working for them at that location, um, but now the company has, you know, now there are 2,000 employees. They don't need all that space, and yet they're under a 10-year lease to make these payments, right? Could they legally reject um, half the floors in that building, uh, you know, allowing, forcing the landlord to rent that space to someone else, whereas otherwise, under that contract, the landlord doesn't have to, right? It's that sort of thing that, again, it's not a perfect solution, but given the reality of what, where the debtor is, here, this is something that may have to be negotiated and the creditor may have to accept this in the long run. And so on and so forth. But the point here is that all of this is leading to, just like there's a plan of payment under Chapter 13, there's going to come out a Chapter 11 plan of reorganization that's going to detail what it is that the uh, debtors and creditors have been able to work out, right? Um, you know, what is that new capital structure? You know, how much of the debt, how much of the contracts, how much of those union uh, obligations was the debtor able to shed such that it is possible, viable, feasible, doable for this debtor to actually sustain itself um, and be able to emerge as a leaner and meaner operation? Um, you know, you think about, you know, I talked about retailers, Macy's, for example. Uh, the whole company has been in bankruptcy. I mean, a lot of uh, uh, airlines, by one by one by one, have have wound up that way, and over time have figured out either a way to either merge or just have leaner operations to at least be uh, in business versus, you know, winding up in Chapter Seven. So, although it almost seems un, um, you know, uh, unfair, if you will, to creditors, you know, we're already talking about, you know, circumstances that are going to be. Uh, painful. The question is, is Chapter 11 a better solution? And for the most part, it usually is a better solution uh, that Chapter 7 would be. And again, procedurally, there is the idea that enough creditors have signed on to this plan of reorganization before a court or a trustee is going uh, to bless it. So again, they're looking at the same sort of thing. Is this plan in the best interest of at least most of the creditors? Uh, is it feasible? Is each class of creditors at least accepting the claim? We know 100% of creditors are not going to accept, but at least is there enough majority consensus in accepting uh, this plan? And if not, uh, basically this sometimes does happen. The court, the bankruptcy court, has the power of cramming down. And what is cramming down? It's a provision where a court can confirm a plan of reorganization, even if there is a very vocal class, and usually it's perhaps the unions, that are saying absolutely, totally unfair, right, um, if certain requirements are met. 
And the notion that the court again is looking at is, well, wait a minute, if we did not do this, the whole operation failed. So it's not just you know, that these workers are gonna go get less, they're gonna get zero if we're gonna wind up in a different course. So yes, you know, looking at it from an objective overall standpoint, yes, one class of predators may be um, taking a big hit here, but the alternative is even worse. So the court does have the power to confirm even if the creditors are objective. And you know, we talk about chapter 11 reorganizations, you know, it's for the big guys and for the little business guys as well. Uh, we know that chapter 11 takes time. It's a whole process, it's a whole procedure. Not every company is you know, a big airline or a big monster retailer or, or GM for that matter. I mean, we did say that smaller businesses can take, uh, 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 take um, advantage, if you will, of chapter 11 as well. So there is sort of this fast track uh, procedural way in which small businesses can do that. Uh, if a small business had debts of no more than you know, $2.3 million for the most part, then they can be put on this expedited track where it's not, the process is not quite as formal. It's, it's quicker. And the idea here is that you know, small businesses run in a very different way obviously than large businesses do and you do have to accommodate procedurally uh, smaller businesses in a different way. So there is just, it's chapter 11 still, but procedurally it is possible for smaller businesses to move the process along a lot quicker. <laughs>